Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm glad you're able to hear, uh, join me here today uh, for our uh, seminar on assessing the impact of web-based attacks. My name's Stacy McBrien, and uh, I'll be uh, walking you through a little bit of information related to the new uh, cybersecurity or CyberSec uh, first responder certification uh, for uh, cybersecurity uh, incident responders and analysts. And I will also uh, be giving some uh, demos on the use of uh, some tools that are covered in the courseware so that you can get a feel for what uh, the course might involve. So First of all, I want to set the stage by looking at the need for trained cybersecurity professionals. We know that uh, there's a lot of uh, security incidents that are occurring today, and we need people that are properly trained to be able to respond to those. Now, these statistics that are given here can be kind of eye-opening uh, because of the fact that uh, organizations could be compromised without even knowing that they have been. In fact, as you can see on the slide, uh, the average amount of time that an organization may actually be compromised before detecting that compromise, seven and a half months. And part of the reason for this is likely because many of these attacks are being uh, launched by very skilled, motivated, and trained organizations that are called advanced persistent threats, or APTs. The other statistic on the slide mentions that when asked, it was found that only one out of three security professionals could actually identify what an APT was. And these would represent nation states, uh, uh, corporate espionage, and other organizations that are just really uh, very motivated. They've got skills, they've got funding, they've got time. And given that, they will eventually gain access to a network if they work hard enough at it. And of course, once they've gained that access, they want to maintain it long term without being detected so that during that window of time, they're able to exfiltrate data from the organization, which is, of course, one of the most uh, significant uh, risks an organization generally can face. So we understand that there is a very real risk out there. We need trained people. And so uh, the logical operations has uh, created, actually about two years ago, a certification uh, called CyberSec First Responder. This certification uh, was designed to target an area of the certification landscape that really was not being properly addressed in the past. There was a big gap between products uh, and certifications like Security Plus and the higher end certifications like CASP or CISSP. Uh, we needed a uh, certification that uh, could validate the actual real-world skills of those that are defending your network every day. We needed uh, people uh, who would act as our cybersecurity incident responders and our incident analysts to be able to learn and then demonstrate the skills needed to protect your organization. And so, as you can see from uh, the roadmap there, Logical Operations has a number of certifications that are actually uh, targeted to fill gaps like that. And uh, CFR, of course, is the one we're going to talk about today. Now, one of the things with uh, CFR is that it's designed to comprehensively cover those two roles. Uh, it does address the involvement of the entire uh, security organization and all the different members and roles of it, but the focus is on training uh, the individuals that would be filling those, those roles I mentioned. And the goal is to ensure that those individuals can be prepared and prepare your network and organization for the attacks before they come, uh, that they know what to do during the attack in order to properly uh, monitor, record, and capture evidence and information. And then after the attack, they also need to be able to analyze and investigate what's happened. All right. And so this is a big uh, chunk of, of the skill set that is going to be required. Now, uh, the CFR 
certification is broken up into four primary uh, domains. Uh, you can see we look at the threat landscape. So you have to understand what threats are out there, how they could impact your organization and cause you potential harm or loss. We are going to also look at uh, passive data-driven analysis, analyzing information from static files and, and things like that that will help us to analyze uh, what has occurred during an attack, and then also active analysis where we might be looking at running processes, uh, what's in memory, uh, network connections that could exist and things along those lines, and then the overall incident response lifecycle as well. Now, this certification really does fill a need in the certification landscape. Uh, it's been around, uh, for, as I said, for a couple of years, and it's uh, anyone that's actually gone through the training, taken the exam, the comments that have come back on this certification have been very positive and very favorable because of the fact that it doesn't try to be everything to everyone. It is very focused. It's uh, specific and delivers those tangible job skills that employers are actually looking for. Now, there may be other organizations that have certifications that may be better known, but uh, they often uh, are very generic, broad, and really don't deliver the real world skills that you need to apply today in your work. Uh, also, of course, uh, the CFR certification is actually quite economical, especially the exam. It's only $300. That actually includes a free retake attempt if you don't pass on your first attempt. And even better, uh, ISCN has made an arrangement whereby they are able to offer a 20% discount on that exam. And you can see the link that is uh, presented there. Uh, on the slide, so you may want to record that uh, that link, and that will uh, take you through to the ICN website where you'll be able to obtain that 20% discount. I have actually uploaded a link to that site uh, in the attachments and links for uh, this uh, presentation. So if you go to the attachments and links, you'll be able to see the link is there, okay? So if you didn't uh, get it off the slide. The CFR uh, course <clears throat> is made up of uh, 11 different lessons, and as you look down the list, you can see that they fit into the four different domains that I'd mentioned earlier on. Now, because of the constraints of time, we really don't have time to go through details on each of these, but as you examine them, I think you can see how they fit into the role of instant analysts and responders as uh, I mentioned earlier. Of course, if you would like to uh, take the CFR official training courses, uh, they are available through many different training providers and also directly through logical operations. I've included a link in the attachments and links to the CFRcertified.com website. And uh, if you go there, you can get all kinds of details about the uh, certification, the training courses, and any other information that you may need as well. So I'd encourage you to check those uh, links out uh, in the attachments and links section. Now, why is CFR different from other security certifications that are already out there? Well, first of all, yes, it does encompass uh, the interactions with the entire uh, IT team and their role in threat analysis and incident response. Uh, again, primarily focusing on the skills that those individuals would need to properly defend and secure your network. And then, of course, deal with incidents as they occur in real time and be involved in conducting investigations uh, following an incident as well. So we have this focus on these two roles. Now, if we compare uh, two certifications, for an example, we have the CFR certification, you can see that the examination for this certification includes 100 items split over only two job roles. Uh, and it mentions DOD job roles because, of course, uh, the Department of Defense 8570 uh, directive um, uh, it has a number of different cybersecurity uh, job roles that are defined, and uh, the CFR has been uh, uh, added to that uh, a little while ago uh, as an approved uh, training for two of those job roles. Now, 
a hundred questions for two roles. It's a fairly challenging exam that does include uh, some fairly deep technical uh, understanding of various uh, commands and tools and processes. On the other hand, uh, CompTIA does have the CISA exam now. Uh, it uh, was CSA+. Plus. Uh, they had to change that because uh, the Canadian Standards Association didn't like it, I guess. Uh, so <clears throat> it's now called CISA. And there's only 85 questions, but they are spread over five different job roles. So again, you can see very focused and uh, specific as compared to much more general training. Uh, so we, in either case, both of these are designed to basically fit after Security Plus and before you would go on to perhaps a more advanced level certification. Uh, CFR does have an advanced uh, updating schedule. Uh, we are already uh, in the second exam version in the two years that the exam has been out. So the goal is to keep this very current and relevant to what is going on in the security landscape today. Another nice thing is uh, if you do pass the exam, you will obtain a uh, free year membership uh, in uh, ISA. And I've got another slide on that coming up. The focus in this exam is not on unnecessary facts or just generalities, but on actual practical knowledge that is going to need to be used in your role. Now, one uh, skill that is seldom found in IT people is the ability to use regular expressions to uh, parse and search uh, text files and log files and uh, data streams in order to identify patterns and uh, thereby identify potential threats or identify data that's being exfiltrated or the sources of information. So one of our uh, lessons in CFR uh, teaches uh, how regex works or regular expressions work and how we can benefit from using those and automating the use of regular expressions to make us more efficient at being able to uh, detect and identify uh, threats that may have hit our network. So that's just an example of the real world practical skills that you're just not seeing in other courses. The exam itself and the courseware has had input from all different aspects of uh, the uh, landscape out there, different industries, government, uh, academic organizations. And so we have tremendous support for the certification that uh, will uh, uh, ensures that it's relevant to all of those different arenas. Now, if you are involved in the, the United States uh, uh, in any way, shape, or form with the Department of Defense uh, as a contractor, perhaps, uh, you're going to typically need to have a certification that is on the approved list of certifications, uh, which is uh, DOD 8570 currently. Now, uh, as we look at this uh, list, you're going to see that uh, we do have uh, a number of uh, different job roles. And the job roles we're interested in are uh, the roles down uh, in, towards the bottom third there. You can see we have the uh, uh, CSSP analyst uh, and over on the right hand side, the instant responder. And the CFR, of course, is approved for each of those categories because it does an excellent job of training individuals for those roles. I've taught other programs for other vendors, and I can tell you that while they may check more boxes that are on this screen, I can tell you that in general, they don't actually deliver the skills that they uh, claim that they deliver. Uh, and uh, the CFR is better in that regard, in my experience. And so that's why I really do stand behind it and recommend it. So if you are looking at uh, either of those roles in the DOD world, World, then you would uh, be well served by at least investigating CFR uh, and looking at what you can learn from it as compared to perhaps uh, some of the other certs that may exist out there as well. So as I mentioned, 
we, um, if you do pass the exam, uh, you'll obtain a free one-year membership uh, in uh, the Information Systems Security Association. There are chapters of ISSA all over uh, the United States, certainly, and uh, you uh, would benefit by, of course, uh, joining them because they often will conduct regular uh, information uh, seminars that can be used to help to keep your certifications current. As you're well aware, probably most security certifications today are ANSI certified, as CFR is, and this means that in order to keep your certification current, you either have to retake the exam every three years, or you're going to have to have some kind of continuing education units or continuing professional education credits that would be obtained through uh, attending seminars, uh, going to conferences, taking training courses, passing exams, uh, and so on. And so uh, ISSA conducts a number of these and would be able to, in this way, help you to keep your certification current and will help you keep your CFR certification current, of course. Now, while we're on the topic, it's good for you to know that uh, by obtaining CFR, you'll be able to use that as a means of keeping some of your other vendor certs uh, alive and current as well. And so CFR uh, qualifies for one credit for each training hour for a number of CompTIA certs, and uh, you can see that uh, those that are listed there actually it delivers up to 50 CEUs for Security Plus. So in this way, uh, you're going to be able to keep that uh, current and fresh. Uh, on the certification training path, you'll see that uh, CFR is positioned uh, as uh, an intermediate certification uh, in between uh, things like Security Plus and CISSP. And so uh, definitely it's a great uh, certification to uh, put on your career path. It helps you to move forward and advance to higher level certs. And uh, of course, the more importantly, it gives you some job skills that you can apply today in your work. <clears throat> So uh, if anyone has any uh, questions related to the certification, I'd love to entertain those. Uh, we do have, uh, of course, a, a question pod, you could say, within our presentation platform here. So if you do have any questions, feel free to fire those in there, and uh, I'll try to address those either during or at the end of the examination, okay, or at the end of the presentation. All right. Appreciate that. All right. So... Uh, let's move on then, and uh, what we want to do now is we're going to move into a bit of a discussion of a section of the CFR courseware so that you can get a feel for you know, some of the type of information that's covered in the course. I'm going to do some demos for you as well, and then uh, you'll see how some of the tools that are mentioned in the course uh, might be used, all right? So, First of all, when we start out, we understand that when we're dealing with web-based attacks, that web applications are perhaps the single most exposed type of application in the world. Web applications are very much at risk because we build them and then we will place them on a public-facing web server and invite 8 billion people to try to attack our application. Now, while that's true, we also have to understand that very often those web applications may have been built by individuals who are able to build nice looking web pages, but their training often does not include the necessary security training that will help them to develop secure websites, but instead they build pretty websites. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the challenge is that we also need specific training to ensure that our websites are designed in such a way that the code is written in such a way that it addresses known security vulnerabilities. And so in order to deal with that, there are many different sources of information that we can address. Now, what I'm going to do here is just jump over to the screen share. And I want to show you uh, one organization that provides valuable information for uh, developers 
and so that they can learn to write better code. And this is really, really important. I've managed uh, developers in the past. I've written a lot of code myself in the past. And, you know, as I uh, mentioned, if you have not specifically been trained uh, to understand the vulnerabilities that can exist and how to avoid them, your code will have security vulnerabilities in it. So this organization is called OWASP. OWASP.org is the website. And this website is actually where I uh, have downloaded the ZAP or ZAttack proxy from. So ZAP is a tool that we're going to be using in our demos. Uh, and of course, you can download it and uh, use it. I've actually uploaded a um, an exercise file that uh, you can use uh, in order to try out Zap on your own after uh, the presentation is done. So please uh, feel free to do that. This is where you would get Zap from. Now, the one thing I want to show you here is uh, every so often they will publish a top 10 vulnerabilities list. And so there is a top 10 vulnerabilities list uh, for 2017 now. And uh, I'm just going to zoom in here a little bit so it's large enough for you to see. And just in the table of contents, I want you to note here the different vulnerabilities that we're looking at. Okay, So they've identified these top 10 vulnerabilities. So number one is injection attacks. We're going to talk about SQL injection, and I'm going to demonstrate that. There's other types of a command injection attacks, but that's number one. And it when it works, uh, it can be absolutely crippling. Uh, broken authentication. Uh, authentication, knowing who is accessing your systems and knowing that uh, they have been properly vetted, that uh, their identity has been properly authenticated, and that uh, there isn't any uh, trickery going on is really important. So that's a big one. Uh, sensitive data exposure, uh, information leakage, uh, and improper storage of information that leads to uh, that sensitive information leaking or being stolen can be bad. Uh, XML, external entities. Um, we've got XML exploits, which are very common today. Broken access controls, where we've got access controls that should be stopping the barbarians at the gate, but it's not working for some reason. There's a flaw or a vulnerability. Misconfiguration can be a big thing today. Uh, and the reason misconfiguration exists is because administrators make mistakes. Administrators don't follow best practices and they don't audit or they don't respond to findings in audits and uh, harden and fix the uh, vulnerabilities that have been identified. So. We want to make sure that we're configuring our systems using secure baselines and standards and best practices to ensure that um, everything is as tight as possible. And then when new vulnerabilities are identified, obviously we have to be patching those systems. Another thing we're going to look at today is cross-site scripting. I'll demo a little bit of cross-site scripting. We're going to talk about that. So that's a big one, right, as well, number seven. Insecure deserialization using components with known vulnerabilities and insufficient logging and monitoring. Uh, this really speaks to that very first slide we looked at, where we talked about the fact that organizations that are compromised could have been compromised up to seven and a half months ago before they identify the fact that someone has been stealing their information. Now, how can we improve that? Well, this is by improving our logging and monitoring, using automated systems, using regular expressions, uh, using uh, uh, SIEM systems, where we're using security uh, incident and event management systems to uh, collect, aggregate, and correlate uh, security uh, logs and other information from all of our hosts, our firewalls, our intrusion detection systems, our proxies, uh, and also from uh, public information sources, security uh, blogs, and, and um, uh, various uh, factors like that, so that we can identify the threats uh, earlier, and respond earlier and thereby reduce the overall risk and impact to our organization. So that's huge. So we understand 
Yep. OWASP, they gives us, give us good guidance. And for each of these, they don't just tell you what it is, they tell you how to fix it. So, you know, for an example with injection, it says, here's the concept, is your application vulnerable? Here's how we can prevent it. And then it gives attack scenarios, references, and there's a lot more detail available on the site. This is just a very quick vignette that will give you some quick guidance and then of course your developers can dig much deeper and learn how to better protect your organization. So that's very big. Now we understand that yes with web applications there's a huge risk now. I think you're all on the same page as I am with that. So let's look at some of the issues. We have two different areas where web threats can occur. One is on the client side and the other, of course, is on the server side. On the client side, uh, often what will happen is the attacker will deliver uh, scripts, often JavaScripts, to the victim's client operating system or browser, and the scripts will be executed on the client. And uh, this can be done through malware and various other things like that. We also, of course, could go after and compromise the server side. And the server side is very commonly the target of attack because, of course, that's where we store the crown jewels. Uh, we've got huge repositories of valuable assets that need to be properly protected. And so because of this, attackers often will target the server side. But we also know that the servers will be attacked, and so therefore they're usually more closely monitored and protected uh, through uh, intrusion detection, uh, firewalling, uh, through hardening of the operating systems, and so on. And so while the servers are a more attractive target in many cases, the endpoints, the clients, are often more vulnerable to attack because they may not have the same levels of protection that the servers have. So we have to make sure that we take into account both of these possible attack points, and that's going to ensure that um, we're protecting our web applications end to end. And of course, we'd want to be using encryption as well for the communication between those systems. So we mentioned cross-site scripting. And cross-site scripting, of course, uh, is a threat that is very significant. There's actually three different variants of cross-site scripting that we need to be aware of. And as we look at uh, cross-site scripting, you're going to see that uh, we have what are called DOM-based attacks. Now, DOM-based attacks are client-side attacks. What happens is the attacker sends uh, JavaScript through to the victim, the victim executes that script, and it runs only locally on the victim's machine. Uh, so uh, often the script might be sent uh, by means of email, the victim clicks on a link in the email, and it executes locally. The other two types of attacks actually execute on the server and then are reflected back out to the client. So we have stored attacks, and stored attacks are usually going to be implemented on websites that perhaps contain uh, an area where uh, participants could comment on a discussion thread where they post things that remain on that website. So if the website is vulnerable to cross-site scripting and vulnerable to stored attacks, what will happen is the attacker will construct a script that they will embed in their comment. And then when anyone reads that comment, the script will be executed on the server and reflected back out onto that client machine that's viewing that particular comment. So that's common. Um, we also have a very common attack, which is a reflected attack. And when we look at reflected attacks, what's happening here is the attacker is normally sending a URL through to the victim that contains the malicious script. The victim clicks on the URL, believing that URL to be a link that sends them through to a trusted server. And what happens is that that uh, script is sent to the, the server, the server executes the script, and then, of course, reflects that back out to the client. Now, uh, this, as I said, is, is very common. And what I want to do is, is do a quick little demo on how this might work. So I'm going back over to my screen share, and what I want to do now is I'm going to uh, bring up uh, a, my email client here, and I've got 
an email that I've created. Now, looking at this email, you can see that I'm going to send this email. I'm currently acting as the attacker, and then I'm going to put on my other hat, and I'll act as the victim. And acting as the attacker here, you can see that I've created a email that says, hurry, your account's going to be closed if you don't update your information. Click on this link, right? So now, of course, if I sent this email out the way it is, you can see here that I've got this URL, and in the URL, you can see there's this long string of hex encoded values, and you know, it's suspicious looking, isn't it? So I'm probably not going to click on this, and maybe you're not going to as well. But what I want to show you is how easy it is to create a phishing email that is um, more convincing. So what I'll do is I'm just going to you know, move this down a little bit. And what I want is I'm going to right-click on my email and say that I want to insert a new hyperlink. Okay, And this new hyperlink is going to redirect, or, or not redirect, but send my victim through to the URL that is presented here. And so I will insert the hyperlink. I will provide the address, which is the script that I want to send through to the victim. So you can see in the bottom dialog box of the dialog, I've pasted that full script. And then up at the top, you can see the text to display currently contains that whole same script. But what I want to do is I'm going to make it look more innocuous. I'm going to get rid of all of that ending stuff. And now I'm just going to have the URL, which is altoromutual.com. Now, this is a website that is, uh, was created uh, as a demonstration website, which would allow the execution of various different um, uh, exploits against it, and the reason it exists is so that the um, vendors can demonstrate their tools uh, and whatnot. So now that I've done this, you can see this is a much less uh, risky looking email, and I'm going to send that email out. Now, if everything is working properly, I should receive that email on uh, my other account, and well, yeah, I did. Uh, look at that. I've got the email, and it says, that you've just received this email from, uh, you know, Stacy McBride at hotmail.com, and you can see this link right here that I'm supposed to click on, and it's the bank. You know, you can trust us. So I've got to update this information, obviously. So when I click on that link, what's going to happen is it's going to send that URL through to this web server, and you can see that what's happened is the script actually was just simply a script that ran an alert, and the alert opens up a dialog box like this and displays the text that was in the script. So uh, this website was vulnerable, and it says, your browser thinks this code is from the trusted server, and I say, okay, and that's the end of that. Now, the actual malicious, the script I used really was not very harmful, but it certainly could have been much, much more destructive. So we start to understand the risks that we might face from cross-site scripting, uh, which we just uh, demonstrated. Okay, So that was what we call a reflected cross-site scripting attack. There's uh, When we talk about cross-site scripting, what's happening there really is the client uh, the web client, trust the server, basically, because you've connected to that server. So whatever comes from that server, the client trusts. And so the scripts coming from the server could potentially uh, read the cookies from that client machine that have been put there by the server and perform other actions. And so because of that, what's happening with cross-site scripting is we, the attacker is exploiting the trust that the client has in the server to which the client believes they're connected. Now, we also have another type of attack that kind of turns that around. It's called cross-site request forgery, and it's written as XSR, XSRF or CSRF. And this attack uh, changes things because what happens now is we're going to exploit the trust that the server has in a client that has connected 
to the server and perhaps even authenticated with that server. So as we examine this, you'll see that the idea here is that the victim might log into their banking website. And uh, when they do this, a cookie will be stored on their machine. Then the attacker sends maybe an email through to the victim that contains a URL. And inside that URL is a script that is going to instruct the bank to perhaps transfer money from the victim's account to the attacker's account. Now, the victim is logged onto the banking website. They're authenticated. So when they click on that link, what happens is the data in that link, the script in that link, is sent through to the bank. And the bank sees the instructions in that script as if they were the actual instructions that a user sitting at that web client entered. And so the bank does what it's told. The bank transfers the money from the victim's account to the attacker's account. Now, this type of attack is easier to detect on the client than it is on the server. Because from the server side, if you're monitoring and auditing what's going on, the server is simply receiving instructions from the client to move money. Now, the server doesn't know that the move is not being entered by the client, but it's being entered by the attacker on behalf of the client. And so because of this, it just looks like normal traffic on the server. The server thinks, hey, I'm just supposed to do a transfer. So it does the transfer. It does what it's told. So that's the problem with XFRF. Uh, XSRF is that it's extremely difficult to identify and detect this type of attack on the server side. Okay. Now we also have SQL injection and SQL injection of course is very powerful. We're going to demo that at the end here. So I'm not going to do a demo on this one right now, but SQL is a common database language that's used across the board on most of our database systems. And what happens here is the attacker modifies um, the value that is being sent to the backend database by entering values in a field on the web page uh, where the web page is expecting perhaps a username or a, a you know a name of a product that we want to query but instead the attacker formats a string that contains SQL commands and instructions so the information that is presented is uh, interpreted as commands rather uh, than as data. Uh, because what normally happens with this is the attacker will send a string through the server that is going to uh, create an unbalanced condition in the dynamic statements that are being used by the developer to construct the SQL query. In order to protect ourselves from this, we should use parameterized SQL queries, and your developers can learn how to do that by, again, you know, looking at the OWASP website, perhaps. But um, the usually one of the most common ways of uh, testing for a SQL injection vulnerability is to create an unbalanced condition with quotation marks. Normally, quotation marks should always come in pairs. And so if we enter just a single quotation mark in an input field and it causes the application to crash or behave abnormally, that would often indicate that we have some type of SQL injection vulnerability that is uh, going to be available. And so we may want to then dig deeper, of course. And uh, so uh, as an example here, I'm just going to jump back to my screen share for a second. I go to this Altoro Mutual website, and if I were to uh, type in uh, something like uh, this, let's see if that's going to work. And uh, you can see what I've done is I've created a situation that has generated an error on the server. So because I've been able to generate an error like this, this tells me this server is probably vulnerable to SQL injection because what I did is I created this unbalanced condition with the number of quotation marks that were entered. Uh, also, you can see this server is not properly sending out sanitized error messages and it's uh, doing things like revealing uh, things 
that we should know, like perhaps the internal structure uh, or directory structure of the web server. So, of course, uh, we, we can watch out for that. It's also displaying the actual parameter names that are being drawn from the web page and injected back to the web server. So we don't want this happening, right? And that gives you an example of, you know, finding a site that's vulnerable. Today, many sites have been uh, configured so that they don't return error messages like that. And because of that, we may have to use a technique called blind SQL injection. Directory traversal is another uh, thing that um, could be a problem with web servers where basically the attacker could uh, change directories, moving up in the directory structure by typing cd dot dot, cd dot dot, moving up in the directory structure and then eventually moving back down to other directories where they could steal files or the information in files. They could even execute files in some circumstances. <clears throat> in order to avoid detection, they may use hex or Unicode encoding of some of the values that are entered on the URL line to avoid detection. Now on the slide, you can see at the bottom there, the string dot dot slash dot dot slash has been translated into percent two e percent two e percent two f. Okay, and that is a hexadecimal representation. The idea being, by doing this, we may be able to avoid filtering by the web server or even detection by maybe an intrusion detection system. File inclusion vulnerabilities would allow an attacker to cause a file to be read from the local file system and then perhaps displayed on the web page or uh, executed if it's a script. And it also, uh, we could use remote file inclusion where the attacker references a URL that points to the attacker's web server where they have stored malicious code that can then be downloaded through this remote file inclusion and executed on the server. And so this is often how attackers will uh, further compromise a server is if they can find a remote file inclusion vulnerability, they can then have that server reach out, pull their uh, malicious code from the attacker's repository and uh, then execute that information. And that can lead to uh, data theft, denial of service, and of course, execution of malicious code on the server as well. There are many other uh, vulnerabilities uh, with web apps and web services. So we've got things like session fixation, where an attacker could use this to attempt to hijack a session by first creating a legitimate session with the target uh, website and then sending a link through to the victim that contains the existing session ID number that the attacker has generated. Then when the victim clicks the link, the victim forms a session with the web server using the pre-existing session ID. Now what that's going to do is it means that the attacker can then subsequently take over that session after the victim has authenticated with the server and this makes it easy for the attacker to hijack that session. <clears throat> Uh, we could also use uh, session prediction if the session IDs are being generated using a uh, predictable uh, sequence or um, algorithm. Click jacking is uh, where an attacker might uh, overlay a web page with maybe an invisible frame or an iframe. And when the victim clicks on a link on the page, what they think they're clicking on is the link, but instead there's actually an iframe hovering over top of that link. And when they click, they are actually redirected through to the website of the attacker's choosing rather than the legitimate link. So maybe they're clicking on a link they think is taking them to their bank, but instead it takes them to a mirrored copy of the bank that the attacker has set up as a farming website. And of course the attackers modified the code so that when the victim tries to log on, uh, the, their credentials are captured, and this, of course, allows the attacker to then come back later on and, and use those credentials. Cookie hijacking and poisoning can uh, steal information from the cookie and inject information into the cookie, which could change the contents of shopping carts, steal session IDs, and other values as well. So this is all very, very risky. 
with our web services, there are many other types of exploits based on uh, the uh, SOAP manipulation of XML code. And uh, so, of course, we have all these things to defend against as well. All right, what I want to do now is just uh, mention a few tools to you, and then we're going to get into our uh, demo at the back end. And if you do have any questions, uh, we can then field those, of course. So make sure you, you get your questions uh, entered into uh, our uh, question pod there, if you would. Uh, so some of the web attack tools that uh, we uh, might uh, use uh, would include SQL Map. I'll sh actually show you SQL Map very briefly uh, today. Uh, SQL Map is a tool that's used to, of course, uh, probe for SQL injection vulnerabilities and test for them. Very capable. It's a, a command line utility. Metasploit Framework, great for penetration testing, a very comprehensive uh, tool set. Burp Suite uh, is really based around the Burp proxy. Uh, often when we're doing web hacking, we'll use proxies to sit between the web client and the server so we can intercept the response and requests that are sent back and forth. We can modify those and of course uh, we're going to actually look at using uh, a proxy in our activity coming up here and I'll demo actually the OWASP Z attack proxy or ZAP. OWASP Web Scarab is an older one. We probably would choose to use ZAP instead. W3AF uh, is a web uh, uh, application security scanner that is an open source scanner, so you can uh, grab a copy of that if you want. Beef is really awesome. Beef is the browser exploitation framework, and it's used uh, to go after the client side. So, like I said, the client side is vulnerable. Uh, it's often not as well protected as the server side, and Beef is the tool set you use for that. Uh, Nikto uh, is, of course, a web scanner, looks for vulnerabilities, and Peros Proxy is another proxy that I believe Zap was based on, uh, but Zap goes way beyond and adds in vulnerability scanning as well. So it's a, a very, very capable tool set. All right. So let's uh, move on then. We're going to do our demonstration now of uh, SQL injection, cross-site scripting. And in this way, you guys will get a chance to uh, see some of the tools that uh, you might want to use. Now, for most of our activities, we're going to be going after this Altoro Mutual website. Uh, it's uh, www.altoromutual.com, and uh, it's a demo site. It's okay to test tools against this site. It's put there for that purpose. Remember that the tools I show you um, are you know, maybe free to download, but you must use them with proper authorization. Don't start scanning sites that you do not have authorization to access, and don't start trying to exploit vulnerabilities that you may identify on those sites, because when you do so, you're crossing a line that you may not be able to come back across, uh, and you're, you're uh, taking off your white hat and you're moving into black hat territory. So make sure that whatever you do, you do with proper authorization. So now I'm no longer liable. <laughs> And uh, uh, we'll move on here. So what I want to do is I, we're going to use the Z attack proxy in order to uh, look at our uh, website and identify some vulnerabilities. Now the Z attack proxy, uh, when you load it up, what I've actually done here is I've loaded up the scan of another website. And I just wanted to show you for an example here that I've scanned this website and down in the alerts box, you can see that it's found cross-site scripting, external redirects, path traversal vulnerabilities, remote file inclusion, SQL injection, and those are all red flags. And then there's some others that aren't as severe. Okay, so this scanning tool, uh, while it may not find everything, it can find a lot. And if it does find anything, you'd better fix it because the bad guys are going to find it too. OK, now what I wanted to show you here is an example of the path traversal vulnerability. You can see over on the right hand side how uh, the what's happened is it sent a URL through the server where we've used hex encoding, where we're representing the slashes as percent to F to, again, break things up and hopefully avoid identification by IDS and filtering by any filters that may be on the web server itself. But what I'm going to start out with here is I'm going to start a new session 
And um, this in this new session, what I want to do is I'm going to click on the Quick Start tab and I'm going to choose to launch a browser. I'm going to use Firefox for this activity because uh, Firefox is not going to be, at least the version I've got here, is not going to be blocking our scripts automatically. Now, the reason I do it through Zap is so that the browser is already pre-configured to use Zap as the proxy. If you run a browser outside of Zap, of course, if it's not set up to proxy, it won't. And so we're going to use Zap as the proxy. And then I'm going to visit our website, HTTP, El Toro, Mutual.com. So there's our website, as you can see. Make the font a little bigger so it's almost visible. And uh, what I want to do is I'm going to go to my online banking webpage, and I'm just going to try to log in here as uh, uh, me and with a password of pass. Okay, and I hit enter, and you can see the login failed. Now, although the login failed, there's a couple of ways of finding out what parameters were sent through to the server. One would be to hit the Alt key, go up to Tools in Firefox, go to my web developer and go down and look at my uh, network uh, tab. And then after, uh, uh, actually I have to send it again, <laughs> me, uh, and I'll put pass in there. There we go. There we go. And you can see it's captured the post that I sent. And then if I click on parameters here, you'll see that in fact, um, I've got three parameters that are being sent by through to the server. I got a user ID, I got a pass W, and I got button submit. So these are the values that are being sent. So you can find those using your browser. But of course, uh, we, if we are set up as a proxy, that information should have been captured by the Z attack proxy as well. So if I click on the history tab here down in the bottom left hand corner and go down to the bottom, you'll see that there is a uh, URL that I visited, which is the um, altoromutual.com slash bank slash log on dot ASPX uh, URL. And above that, you can see the values that were sent through to the server. Okay. Those are on the request tab, of course. Now, um, now that I've got that, you can see that, yes, I'm sending some information through there. And what I want to do is I want uh, to see if maybe that link is vulnerable to SQL injection. So I'm going to re right click on that and choose attack. And then under attack, I'm going to choose active scan. And so when I choose the active scan, it's going to <clears throat> do a scan uh, to see if there are known vulnerabilities there on that uh, particular link. I'll click start scan. And so my scan is running. If I go over to the alerts tab, as the vulnerabilities are identified, they will appear there in the alerts tab. Now, uh, what will happen is it will identify and detect that there's a SQL injection vulnerability there. Okay, And you can see it's found two so far. And uh, so I can go to either of those. And you can see I've got the user ID. And I also have the password vulnerability that's been identified. So what I want to do is I'm going to use the information that's been provided here uh, that has been sent through the server under pa the password to attempt to log on. Now you can see that this is the value that's being sent, but again, we're doing hex encoding when we actually send it. Okay. So I'll switch over to Altoro Mutual and I'm going to try and log on using that information. So I'm going to log on as admin and then I'm going to type test. I'm going to type the single quotation mark or space single quote one single quote equals single quote one single quote dash dash, which is an inline comment character uh, for SQL. And you can see that it's logged us in. OK, so the uh, sequence that I sent basically was the sequence that you see listed right here. OK, now that I've done that, uh, we are authenticated on that server. So then the next thing is let's go deeper. And what I'm going to do is look at viewing my recent transactions on this server. Now, when I view the recent transactions, uh, what I want to do 
is I'm going to type a date in my date field here and try to do a query. And I'll hit submit, and you know, it says, okay, the after field, it hasn't returned anything, but uh, no errors or anything, so that's all right. Uh, if I go back to my history tab, you'll see that now I've got a new URL that could have a vulnerability on it, and I could scan that individually as well. Now, I don't have to do these individually, but uh, I could scan the entire website, but of course it'll only scan the areas I have access to, and so that means that I won't be able to scan the areas that are hidden behind the authenticated uh, portal. So uh, right now, of course, the area I'm scanning would only be scannable after I've authenticated, but that's what's happening now. So I'm doing a scan here, and what should happen eventually is I should come up with a third SQL injection vulnerability, which I have done. Now you can see that, yes, we have a SQL injection vulnerability that's been identified here on this point, and so what we want to do is we're going to try and um, see how that, uh, that might be exploited. And uh, so I'm going to um, type in here and maybe what I'll do is uh, well first of all I might try to uh, do what's called fuzzing now fuzzing is where we're going to send varying sequences of values through to the server uh, looking for uh, you know either buffer overflows or potential exploits and things like that so what I might want to do if I wanted to fuzz that particular URL would be to go to the after section and highlight the value that was sent behind the after parameter. So you can see that that after parameter, I've highlighted the entire value that's being sent. And now the next step is I want to right click on that and I'm gonna replace that parameter by fuzzing it. I'm going to choose a payload I'd like to send and there's lots of options here with our payloads. I'm going to go to my uh, file fuzzers, perhaps. I'm going to expand JBro fuzz. I'm going to go down to SQL injection attacks. And I'm going to just choose a basic SQL injection. And in the uh, uh, box below, it uh, displays the you know sequences that are going to be sent through by choosing that. Now, obviously, there are many others that uh, we could use. What I'm doing here really isn't going to do much for us, but it gives us an example of fuzzing. And so I'll start the fuzzer. You can see down on the bottom right, the values are being sent through. Uh, where it says reflected, the actual payload uh, that was sent has been reflected back in the response header. And so you can e examine the requests and responses uh, that were sent. Here's one where it said 23 or 1 is equal to 1. And uh, as we examine uh, that value that was uh, sent through to the server, then uh, it's basically came back with an OK value, so that might indicate that that one was successful, OK? So anyway, that gives you an idea of what fuzzing is for us. Now, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to actually try to go ahead and uh, exploit that field. And of course, you saw a number of the different values that were sent through, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move forward and use a technique uh, to try to display information in this grid that's shown below. <clears throat> I'm going to try to use a <clears throat> excuse me union command now <clears throat> the union command is used to join the output of uh, queries together and uh, display them and so i'm going to do a union select star from users dash dash and you're going to say well where did you come up with the table name users and i'll say well uh, I know it's there, but what we could do in order to find that is I could simply use uh, SQL map in order to do that. And I'm starting to run low on time here, but I do want to show you SQL map. And the way SQL map would work is this. We run SQL map, and using the command that I just entered, you'll see that it's identified a user's table on that database. OK, and so because I've been able to identify that user's table, then, of course, uh, that shows me that I can go deeper. And then using SQL map, you could do things like uh, query the contents of the user's table and so on. Now, I received this error 
when I did the query. And so, of course, that tells me I've got a SQL injection flaw here, but I still need to do it differently. And actually looking at that error message, you would have noticed, <clears throat> perhaps, that it says that the number of columns does not match. And so this is telling me <clears throat> that I need to make the number of columns that I am retrieving match the values that are being displayed on the grid. And so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to display my um, username, password, and a null column. And now you can see that I've stolen the credentials using SQL injection. We already saw cross-site scripting. I demoed that to you. But you'll see that in the little activity that I provided to you, there is also uh, additional um, activity related to cross-site scripting that you can perform. Well, that wraps up our uh, presentation. We've used our 60 minutes. I don't see any questions from anyone, but uh, of course, I uh, hope you've enjoyed your time here with me today and uh, that you've learned a little bit about the CyberSec First Responder Certification and a little bit about cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Uh, please do download the uh, SQL injection cross-site scripting exercise and uh, try it out, but remember only perform those activities against sites to which you have authorization. I've actually included a couple of other sites on that page that you are, uh, that it's okay for you to, uh, to test as well. Don't forget the 20% CFR exam discount and check out the CFR uh, exam information on our website, which is also uh, an additional link. So thanks everyone. Hope you've enjoyed everything today and uh, look forward to, to maybe seeing you out there uh, on the internet uh, on another presentation. All right, take care now. Good night.